Welcome to the Watch Reactions channel, and welcome to this third and potentially final episode in the Rise of Casio series, which covers the history of Casio's key contributions from 1990 to 1999. The earlier episodes on the early history and the 80s do look at the other videos on my channel, and if you like the video, do please consider liking and subscribing. It really helps give me the small motivation to put the effort into these. As caveats, I've been a bit fast and loose in grouping together the years in which I bring the different watches in. Uh, this is to aid the story, so do be gentle with me if the chronology is a little bit suspect. Even if we are just talking modules, of which there are normally multiple references and colorways, we're nearly at 500 watches plus during the 90s, so I can't be comprehensive. I've tried to weave in the major milestones, and I've also put in some oddities and personal favorites along the way because I thought that people would find these interesting. So let's begin. The 1990s starts with a whole range of circular stainless steel timer models that are in very high demand today. The first in this family was the DW400 tachymeter, with DW meaning digital water resistance. And with clever setup, this can digitally convert times into miles per hour. This watch is famous for being on the wrist of Jean-Claude Van Damme, in the 1995 film, Time Cop. Even more sought after is this DW403 surfing timer with its unique color accented look and blue and red visual displays to support surfers. Within the same lineage of watches, we also have the beautiful Skywalker watches with later surfing models that keep the similar aesthetic coming with some added curves and a vibrant yellow compass bezel amongst other colours. Let's get into some 1990s graph models. So obviously based upon the original Trigraph series, hashtag the Donny, shout out retro time, let's make that sandwich toast. Not in chronological order, but in complexity order, 1994's Killer Instinct commentator Chris Sutherland takes us through different graph models. Campbell. First we have the Quattro, which I believe is actually from 1990. When Random Rob reviewed it, he referenced it as Spider Eyes, which I think fits quite nicely. It has a second time zone, it has the Mojo on, a pseudo analog clock, a timer and an AM-PM indicator. Next we have the Pentagraph, which launched in 1989 and was a referee's watch that could actually be adopted to all sorts of sports, including football, basketball, including the brakes, and a scorekeeper. The five displays are all different kinds of timer options. Extreme combo. I think the hexagraph may even be as early as 1987. Uh, this includes a pseudo analog clock, a marker of AM, PM, and whether the alarm or timer is on, the small dial on the left shows the mode it's in, with the remaining three being three different 20 second counters. Ultra combo! The radial graph is a different format in this series with radial display. I must admit I've got no idea how it works and info is thin on the ground, so do put in the comments if you have any insight or leads on useful material. Wild game dude! Sonic's release aligns nicely with the theme of 1991, which was speed. In mechanical land, there's an esteemed history of getting to more and more precise timing, with the Hoyer micrometer being an icon due to its ability to capture increments of one hundredths of a second, which is a heritage that they're still clinging to, even with the tag association, with the more recent mechanical chronometer able to achieve one one thousandth of a second increments in 2016. In digital land, if you believe Seiko, they released the first digital stopwatch as part of the 1964 Olympic Games. This later model was a bit easier to see. David Cox, who ran Cox Electronic Systems in the US, I think may disagree with this if you see his blog on the topic, claiming to be first on this with the Digitimer. Hoyer had a digital timer able to capture one one thousandth increments too, 
and the first electronic digital stopwatch is apparently, as far as I can gather, the AccuSplit from Harper Time Electronics. The LED chronograph in a watch was also pioneered by Hoyer in 1975 with the Chronosplit, and a true LCD chronograph was released in the watch 0634A by Seiko. I've not been able to identify who was first on the 1 1,000th of a second LCD watch, but what I do know is that Casio made a really big deal about it in 1991 with a whole array of watches that they introduced this feature to, starting, as I understand, with the DW6000, which looks suitably sonic-like with its angular and spiky lines. The GPX 1000 also had this function, with watches released in later years also boasting this capability, with some examples on screen, like the Speed Timer, this SKX, no, not that one, models combined with LED indicators that flashed when you're approaching time. And while I'm on the topic, this is just an excuse to throw in this funky colored marine timer. With the G-Shock range also later integrating this capability, I think in 1993, with this asymmetric looking DW6200. A theme that had been brewing for a while, but that manifested more for me in the 90s, was planners and ultimately the idea of a personal digital assistant or PDA. An early forerunner of this is the British company Scion, who in 1984 launched their Organizer series, with the Scion Series 3 coming out in 1991. John Scully, who was CEO of Apple at the time, really brought the PDA concept into the zeitgeist in 1992 with the Apple Newton, although they didn't actually ship this until the end of 1993. In Casio land, the VDB100 links into these developments and also includes the touchscreen technology you'll remember me going into in my last video on Casio in the 80s. Beyond these data bank modules, other Casio watches were starting to introduce these planner elements, such as the flight planner, the touring master, and the multi-planner. With these watches, you can start to set multiple reminders for different times, including the ability to customize for a specific event. From looking at videos on this, it doesn't seem to be the most convenient or efficient process. In my video on 80s Casio, we delved into some of the very rich history on physicians' pulse watches. The monitoring of blood pressure also has its own fascinating history, which Casio plays into. Some key milestone points are Samuel Siegfried Karl Ritter von Basque's Mercury Field Svig Mamanometer. Try and guess how many times in the comments it took me to say that. Riva Rocci's 1896 model, which clo gets closer to what we know of today, with Korotkov adding the final piece to the puzzle by acknowledging diastolic pressure, which he measured through a stethoscope in addition to the systolic pressure that the previous models had considered. The 80s saw at-home electronic blood pressure very widely available, with Panasonic being one of the very first in the 1970s. So Casio was playing into a very established market with the 1991 BP100 and later BP120, which you can see includes both systolic and diastolic pressure. In this catalogue of the time, kindly shared by Christian Charlo on his YouTube channel, you can see Casio broadly boasting of the technology. It helpfully explains that this uses two different sensors. The first of these is the electric potential sensor, which completes a circuit through your body, through your finger on the sensor and the contact with the watch on your wrist. This is then able to pick up when your heart contracts. The photo sensor uses an LED light to detect small fluctuations which show the arrival of red blood cells that indicates that a pulse wave has arrived. This interval is the pulse wave transit time which can then be converted into showing your blood pressure in the display. As you can see, Casio was well before the current fitness focused apps with its marketing towards health and fitness with these watches. A last oddity has its roots in the biorhythms craze that Satina Biostar Electronic did long before, which is based on the idea that you can determine your given intellect, 
physical prowess and emotional sensitivity based on your birth year for given days. This was the Casio Biograph, which is a fun one to know about. Nineteen ninety two was obviously when Timex went to market with its Indiglow, which integrated into its Ironman Triathlon series, which we'll come back to. However, Casio was still launching its own sports related models, including this funky triathlete focused offering with the Tri Sports. Admittedly, this is actually from nineteen ninety one, but I'm fitting it here. This AW60 exercise planner I also thought looked very cool and it includes this fitness tracking and calorie counting component long before Fitbit. There's a great video on watching Casio that goes into the features and also notes its similarity in style to the Swatch watches at the time. In short, you set up the basic parameters as per the instructions on the screen now, set your intensity level, put it in fitness mode and start the timer. This will then start to track your exercise and calories burned. You can then save the outputs into a memory which you can later recall and you can save a week's worth of data which you can then look at day by day. Other fun models in this vein are this 90s version of the Jogging Calorie series as well as this fun Swin Trainer with very unique colouring. 1992 I believe also sees the release of the DW5900 with the three eyes display and apparently the first strong resin case, which I know nothing about. This watch is affectionately nicknamed the Walter due to its very present appearance on John Goodman's wrist in The Big Lebowski. Dude, you don't want to know about it, believe me. Yeah, but Walter... Hell, I can get you a toe by three o'clock this afternoon with nail polish. The Walter is available in some cool colorways and is still going today, as you can see on the Shockbase website. We've explored calculator watches at length in my other videos, but one innovation in this area that was in the 90s was the flip-top style watches, with the IA1000 series being at the classier end of the spectrum, with this video from Digital Casio YouTube doing a nice demonstration. The more rectangular versions of the flip top were the FTP series, including the FTP 10 and the FTP 30. Some final ones I just wanted to drop in for 1992 with this cool horseshoe looking twin sensor, the ALT 6000 using module 950, and this chunky G Shock DW 6100 thermometer watch. These sensors, which build on those that we talked through in the 80s, will combine with some other watches that we'll look at in 1993 as the foundations for another famous series of Casio watches that we'll get into for the 90s. Nineteen ninety three is when I'm bringing Casio's compass focus watches into the equation. Although for the Greeks have been playing around with magnetite or lodestone, which was a material with magnetic qualities for quite a long time, its use in navigation is often attributed to China, with references to an iron fish in water pointing south as early as ten forty. There was a long period of people trying to solve a problem which was where there was a deviation or magnetic declination, as it was called, for land navigation between true north versus magnetic north. And it was actually a British guy, so Edmund Halley, who was the comic guy, uh, in 1701, who charted these differences on this cool-looking isogenic map. Now, digital compasses are a form of microelectromechanical system, or MEMs, that are embedded into an integrated circuit that have magnetic field sensors or a magnetometer that feed data on the relationship between the watch and the Earth's magnetic field into a microprocessor that then converts this into the digital display. I've not actually been able to find who was first with an integrated digital compass into a watch, but these CPW series are Casio's first and start to have a lot of the aesthetics that we will start to associate with later models of outdoors Casio focus watches. The CPW300 is a very specific form of compass watch, a Kibler, which has a compass uh, that has a history that goes all the way back to the 13th century, and this determines the direction of Mecca for Islamic prayers. 
we would see Seymour Powell, a design company working with Casio on some of these outdoors style watches, which is a partnership that we'll come back to later with some classic later models. Television remote control has a fun history with its more widespread use, beginning in 1955 with the Flashmatic from the very appropriately watch relevant Zenith. An interesting venture into remote controls I couldn't help but put in the video was actually from Steve Wozniak of Apple fame, who in one of his ventures outside of Apple developed the core universal remote. But of course, it wasn't long till the remote was attached into a wristwatch, and this was done largely in a novelty way with the CMD10 modules 1028 and 1138. Later models would include the CMD20 and CMD40. Whenever you want to take control of a TV or VCR, look no further than your wrist. It's a game! The Casio Remote Control Watch. The perfect gift. Now, I didn't know this before this video, but the 5500 G-Shock 2 was often referred to as the Mudman due to the design of the buttons that made it more resistant to getting mud in it. This would actually be later into a formal watch in 1995 with the Mudman series, the DW8400. This tradition of names for these watches was the basis for the Master of G series, which were more professional watches that came at a premium and were designed for very specific uses. The first major instance of this was 1993's Frogman series with module 1084, which was an ISO accredited diver, unlike the prior depth gauge style watches that Casio had released in the 80s. Apparently the design was based upon a submarine hatch cover. I believe that things really kicked on with the Frogman uh, in 1995 with the DW8200 titanium model, which was rust resistant and use module 1294. The fun case back with the diving frog on these frogmen was the first of many characters that would be used on later Master of G series watches. Some other 1993 oddities I wanted to mention in passing were the weird, almost car tire looking NF11, ably modeled by one of my fave Instagram accounts, Hitmix, this horoscope model, and this clean looking pace sensor that combines data bank functionality and pace runner functions. And finally, this very aerobic instructor looking fat burning watch. Right, I went down a big rabbit hole on this one, so do stay with me, I promise I come back to the point. So fungi that's present in wood that's decaying emit a luminous glow, which is a form of bioluminescence that's known as fox fire. This was used in our old friend the turtle, which I've also referenced in my previous video, as the first user of the depth gauge, and it used it to light up the barometer and compass. Interestingly, the Finnish call the Aurora Borealis Revontule, which means fox fire, nicely displayed in this promotional material for Visit Finland. This is not to be confused with Firefox the Mozilla browser, actually named after a red panda, I told you I was down a rabbit hole, or the movie of the same name featuring Clint Eastwood, but we'll come back to why this is relevant later. The field of electroluminescence is about glowing light that's not generated by heat, but ra rather the release of energy in the form of photons seen as visible light using electric fields. This is normally put back to 1907 with Captain Henry Round, who in a short paragraph note stated that whilst in his job at the Marconi company, he'd seen a yellow light when a current was sent through a silicon carbide detector. In 1923, some very detailed work from the Russian Oleg Losev confirmed that this luminescence was not thermal, that was generated through heat, but was rather a cold form of light. Now, George Desitro brings the link back to a reference we're always making in these videos, the work of Marie Curie, who are pioneers of both the piezoelectric effect, as well as radio luminescence that later evolved into tritium, and of course, later technologies such as super luminova and lumabrite. He worked with Marie Curie and apparently was the first to coin the term electroluminescence or electrophotoluminescence. One of the formative technologies to bring this electroluminescence into products was the development of thin film electroluminescence, or TFEL, 
which was pioneered by Natalia Blasenko and A. Popkov in 1958. And they used a thin film of zinc sulfur between layers of glass, electrodes, and insulation, rather than the loose powders that were used in these previous experiments. This would then be progressed through the work of Aaron Vecht with the development of electroluminescent panels, and then was really pushed on by the nemesis of Casio, which was sharp, with Toshio Inaguchi's team presenting their work on high brightness TFELs at the Society for Information Display in 1974. This was picked up on, it's presumed, by the Tektronix company, who would later spin out their Planar Systems division. This company focused on these EL displays and are now the dominant market leader in these technologies, still widely used in the medical industry due to their high contrast at any viewing angle versus LCD displays. Sharp still operates in this field in some niche areas and even presented an electroluminescent display TV at one point before refocusing back towards LCD, leaving Planar as the dominant force. So let's get back to watches. Timex had been gaining a lot of ground on Casio with its patented Indiglo technology, first launched in 1992 with very direct jabs at Casio. Until now, lighted watch dials were really hard to see in the dark. But the Indiglo nightlight from Timex is so dramatically brighter. Nighttime will never be the same. Casio's response would start in 1994 and hit full steam in 1995 with Fox Fire. I told you that would all make sense. And this was the model that they launched in Japan, with the Illuminator being the name outside of Japan in the DW6600 series. Casio is tough. And it glows. G-Shock, Illuminator, Casio. As this G-Central article lays out, this watch has become a very big favorite of military personnel, with the front-facing EL backlight being a large part of the appeal. Another early use by Casio was the W740, which was the real Mission Impossible watch, which folks often think is the DW5300. Thanks to the excellent 50G's blog for this great nugget of information. This linkage continues with the DW6900, which was featured in Mission Impossible 2, which was also very EL forward. Now I'm no expert in the technology, but from reading on the topic, Indiglo technology works by having two conductors with a phosphor layer in between, which you can then apply alternating current to, which excites the phosphor and releases photons and therefore light. To get enough power, the normal battery is not actually enough, so a transformer is needed which boosts the power. When this is occurring, you hear a high-pitched noise, which is the vibrating transistor associated with the transformer. You can hear it in my Timex Atlantis here. Casio would begin to integrate electroluminescent technology into most of its models, including calculators with the DBC63. Of course, I had to reference the Cognit Schema model, as I'll come back to later, and also this Juro 200, as well as analog watches like Module 1309. The DW8195 is a fun G-Shock model focused on the EL aspect with a fun graphic that was integrated into the backlight, which you would see a lot in limited editions, and still do. 1994 also saw the release of the DW001, which was the first use of the so-called capsule tough technology, which I'm not sure I fully understand, but something I do get is its nickname, which is the Jason, so named after the mask of Jason in Friday the 13th. It comes in a few colorways uh, over the years, and I thought this one in particular was quite fun. This next one really impresses me as being well ahead of its time, which is the Casio Vivcell. Now this watch is able to pick up when your mobile phone is ringing and vibrates to let you know that this is the case. It's unbelievable technology for its day, and an updated model would later come out in 1998. 
check out some YouTube videos of these that are still working today. Another mad one from this year is the Thermo Scanner watch with module 1190, which could scan the surface temperature of objects. This tie dye UV detector, the UV 700, and also some other oddities such as this random number generator for lottery players, a 1000 hour chrono to compete with the likes of the Hoyer Monaco, and the very sought after Gundam watch. As I've mentioned, Casio was building multiple sensors into watches since the 80s, with 1995 also seeing a G-Shock version of this with the DW6500. A non-G-Shock deployer of the triple sensor was the ATC100 in 1994, which would later be branded and launched under the ProTrek banner with the DPX500. This packages together the sensor and compass technology that we've seen up until this point. In 1996, this would include an auto backlight, which was the next layer of advancement on that technology, and obviously useful for outdoor navigation purposes. I've struggled to see what watch used this first. I also saw this watch using module 1464 from 1995, which also references the auto light switch feature. The use of handheld GPS combined with the compass was already available in 1992 with the Swedish company Silver's device. As I won't come back to it, it's also worth mentioning that in 1999, the ProTrek series introduced the GPS onto this very bulky looking model. Another fun reference from 1995 was this Super Cyber Cross game watch, which used infrared technology to create this game that could be played with friends. This is the first in the very weird JG series, which we'll come back to. The other Mad Detour in 1995 we'll take is the Friendly Memo series. Long before Bitmoji, this allowed you to create personal avatars next to your contacts, complete with different hairstyles and expressions. You could also check your look level and very strangely map up your contacts to check compatibility. This was also launched in circular colourful formats, including very weird models that had cats and dogs rather than humans, a very strange avenue in Casio land. A technology that Casio seemed to go hard on starting in 1995 was Twincept, which was essentially an LCD layer that sat on top of a normal analog watch. I provided a bit of a slideshow of some of these so you can see some of the flavors that came out over those couple of years that this was really prominent in Casio's portfolio. The last cool reference I didn't want to miss in 1995 was the so-called Heavy Metal Gundam or Stargate because of its regular use in the Stargate SG-1 TV series. Tomb Raider from IDOS Interactive. Upon review, it becomes clear that 1996 was definitely a girl power year and Casio were very much clued into this. The first small-sized G-Shock targeted at girls was actually in 1994, which was the DW520, but you notice that it doesn't say Baby G. Well, remember before I mentioned about Seymour Powell? Well, as well as some other Cassiers, these guys developed things like the cordless kettle, but of particular importance here is that they helped to design the original Baby G models, like those that you can see on screen now. You can see here a typical advert of the time that had an obvious target audience. Get cute, get tough. The Baby G series would also have the G-Mix models that had popular songs of the time. And 1996 also saw the start of the Lovers Collection, which would have his and hers G-Shocks and Baby G's. This is the male half of the collection. More recently, the branding has been updated to target adult women rather than just younger girls, but there were some earlier forays that kind of tapped into this 
which included this very cool Baby G Frogman watch. 1996 also saw the introduction of the backlight to the G-Shock Square with the 5600 series. This model is very much the classic and the number and variety of different colours really exploded over the years with this particular model. You can see some examples on shock base here. Taking it up a gear, we get to the MRG or Mr. G series. This was a passion project of Kakuo eBay and the spare time of people he could get to volunteer on a metal version of the up until then plastic resin G-Shock. The ambition was to pass the same high bars of resistance, but in metal. The M and the R of Mr. G stand for majestic and reality. The reality is hitting the standards of resistance set for the original G-Shock, with majestic being the tapping into Japanese artistry and craftsmanship. The team succeeded, launching the range in 1996 with both circular and rectangular models, and in later years, the inclusion of analog models. Two final models I'll mention for 1996. One is the pushback against the touchscreen technology into more D-pad style designs with the Hot Biz series, with the other just being a model I liked, which was a Cognit Schema data bank done in collaboration with the Archaeological Institute of America. Goldeneye, load a rumble pack and see how it feels when 007 meets M64. Remember that mad JG series? Well, in 1997, we see another one with the Cybermax 300, which is a watch that's able to detect the force of your punches and kicks. Cybermax. If you have a flash through the manuals for this watch, you'll see that it doesn't just have a meter mode, but also has a game mode where you can play against friends and compete. This Cartoon Heroes version for Japan, complete with manga style packaging, I think is a real collector's item and a fun random Casio reference I think it's worth knowing. 1997 also sees some new additions to the Masters of G range. The Rise Man is for those doing things at high altitude, think rock climbers, mountain bikers and such, with its inclusion of barometer, altimeter and temperature, with the angel on the back matching this profile. The Gauss Man brings with it an anti-magnetic focus. This is the G-Shock equivalent of the Rolex Milgauss or Omega Railmaster. It was originally actually labelled as a Mud Man before being refocused. I love the branding on the case back on this one. The Fisherman, which included the tidal graph with the other reference, with the case back being this mermaid. And whilst we're here, a couple of other watches to note are the beginning of the Futurist series, and also some Pathfinder references. Being honest, I struggle to plot the course of Pathfinder versus Protrek. The Nokia 6100 series is everything you want in a cellular phone, plus a few extras you might not expect, like a calendar and a calculator, and three games and you can connect it to a laptop PC or a printer using the cellular data suite or the built-in infrared link. 1998 sees another Master of G entrant in the Rays Band which was the first use of tough solar technology. This would also have the full auto electroluminescent backlight and a cool case back with this bat. Timex data link had been going for a while at this point with this fun ad showing the early non-Bluetooth wireless technology. The revolutionary new Timex data link watch uses light beams to transfer dates and data from your computer to your wrist with just a touch of your paw. Pretty smart, eh? The Timex data link watch. From what I can tell, this Casio HBX 100 in 1998 was Casio's attempt to keep up, but it didn't seem to have the same profile of Timex, which had the likes of Bill Gates and Bill Clinton as advocates. The Extreme series focused on extreme sports participants was already available before 1998, but it was around 98 with the introduction of the G-Lide or Glide series that focused on surfers that this aesthetic took off more. 
My very first G-Shock was actually one of these, which was the DW9000 in green, and I'm so gutted I lost it many years ago. The 50G's blog does a nice post on this series. This is a year in which Casio also tried to go down more of the fashion route with the G-Shock with this cool G-Cool series, which never really seemed to take off. Other fashion attempts on the ladies' side are with the Casio Sheen, which I've also seen around. An interesting foray into the dance music scene or trance scene was the G-Mix series, which recently seems to have been revitalized in app form. No one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. In our final year of the 1990s, we first see the G-Shock Lungman, which was targeted at runners with the pulse check function. The Revman, which has two separate chrono displays. The Golfman, which I believe replaced the Fisherman. And the Wademan, which was the G-Shock version of the ProTrek or Pathfinder, with a rotating compass and digital compass. Some final mentions are, I believe, early versions of the Edifice range, and also some early versions of the Lineage series and the Beside series, which I'd not seen elsewhere. And there you have the third installment of this series on the rise of Casio, potentially the last, although I could be tempted by the 2000s, so let me know if you want more. I enjoyed making this one, and if you enjoyed listening and watching, please do consider liking, subscribing, and leaving any comments down below. You can see me on Instagram at Watch Reactions, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.